Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us for this work session of the Story County Housing Study with the Board of Supervisors. Um, I see that we have um, uh, Mayor Bappy from Polo on, Mayor Kavorik from Cambridge on, um, Nick Sorensen with the Chamber, uh, Vanessa Baker Latimer with Ames, and I see iPhone on the um, Zoom. Um, could you identify who you are that's on the iPhone? I think you just have to unmute yourself, which would be star nine. Me, the Connor with Huxley. Oh, great. Your, your name again was? <laughs> yeah, Rita, I'm sorry. Rita. <laughs> I got a little feedback on our on our owl. That's why I didn't hear that um, correctly. Um, and we currently have here in our meeting room is um, all three supervisors, Supervisor Faisal, Merkin, and myself, um, Leanne Harder, our communications and outreach, and then um, Sandra King, our director of external. Um, so I think we'll go ahead. And I know that uh, Nick Sorensen and Leanne Harder were going to do the, the else just came on. Connecting to audio yet. So, Jean, um, I see that you've just joined us. Can you tell us who you are with, what community you're with? Might be having problems. I think. Still says connecting to audio. Well, we can come back and have them introduce who they're who they're with as they um, as they come on. Um, so we'll turn over to Nick Sorensen and Leanne Harder to begin the presentation on the Story County Housing Study. Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. My apologies for having to do this through the phone due to whether I'm having some technical difficulties, but we'll get work through that. Um, this housing study uh, was conducted by RDG and Associates out of Des Moines. And the, the process actually began with you all before I even started September 28th of last year. Um, it's been a long process and uh, it's very in depth. And this is more of a condensed version uh, on the county's webpage, there is a, uh, a link to the full 114 page report if you choose to, to view that. Um, next slide, please. I'm trying that. Okay. Okay, there we go. All right, so the process, you know, number one, why do a housing study? Well, everybody knows, uh, you know, housing is needed across the state and it's just how much is needed where and that's where this is very specialized for story county um the the discovery process was identifying and, and listening to those key stakeholders whether they're real estate agents developers uh the people here present at this meeting whether it be a, via zoom or in person and then after that, it's identifying gaps, opportunities, establish strategic goals. You know, identifying the gaps. Um, gaps are what you're going to find in an untested market. That's going to be where you haven't had a new uh, fourplex built for a few years, and the rent structure would be stuck, let's just say, in 2003. Well, that rent won't necessarily work with the cost of construction these days. So it's how do you... I, how do you tackle those gaps? And that's where the goals come into play. And then after that, we're you know defining in the strategies and actions. That's to go towards the gaps. That's to go towards what challenge you each individually in your communities are, are having when it comes to housing. Um, you know, there's the one thing that they did say. Um, over and over in Story County is the housing stock is very good. And I come from a, a county where the housing stock is not good. And what I mean by good is in good condition. 
Um, typically, you don't come into a county of this size and not have an extensive amount of dilapidation. So I think that speaks volumes about what you all are doing currently with what you have existing. Uh, that doesn't mean there isn't room for improvement. So next slide. The findings on the market survey, part of the survey, which y'all I'm sure you all remember taking, but it was a long time ago, probably don't remember all the questions, but uh, the perceived availability to the respondents for uh, uh, who looked into renting in the past three years. So that's perceived, not actual. And, you know, the green's going to represent the undersupply. Uh, 500 a month and under, they, they are considered undersupplied by the people who filled out the survey. And then the oversupply, you really don't get into uh, strongly until that 1,000 to over 2,000 a month uh, in rent structures. Next slide. So then it comes to the perceived uh, availability for the purchase on the respondents. And as you can see, overwhelmingly, uh, 100,000 and less is considered under supply. Um, part of that is just driven by the market. There's very, I won't say there's very, uh, very few habitable homes, but there's very few homes under that $100,000 uh, point that are for sale throughout um, Story County. And same thing up to 150. Um, once you start getting that 200 and 300,000, that's when you start to see an oversupply. And that's, that's just reflective of what it costs to build a home these days. Um, and your market's driven by what it costs to build new, a percentage of that is gonna be what your existing stock is. Next slide, please. So then, they asked a few uh, specific questions. So I, I know I sent an email out to all of you just out of curiosity on the property maintenance code. And surprisingly, you know, 56% support uh, better enforcement of that. Um, along with that, removing of dilapidated housing uh, using, you know, public funding was at 81%. Well, you know, that your stock that you have is very good. There's probably only a handful throughout the county with maybe the exception of Ames uh, that's considered dilapidated. And then support for use of public funding for rehab or renovations. And that's just kind of the, that's the old adage of take care of what you got if you can. And that's where you can, you can if you choose to use property maintenance codes to kind of leverage those uh, public funding for housing renovations. Next slide, please. This is a representation of, you know, your residential construction activity um, from 2010 to 19. Um, you know, we start to see a little bit of multifamily gaining in, in 2016 and 17. Now, the one thing I want everybody to take into consideration on this study is Ames is excluded from this study. So when we see 16 and 12 in 2016 and 2017 multifamily units being built, uh, those weren't built in Ames. Those were built uh, in one of the municipalities outside of there. Um, next slide. So this one I find uh, interesting in the aspect of uh, single family home sales in Story County, excluding Ames. If you look in 2017, they were averaging about 160,000. Then you jump to 2018, 183, to 2019, 188. But also the increase uh, in the amount of housing sold. So it just, it definitely um, shows demand there, but also the amount, amount of days on market, um, I think that's important to pay attention to because when you average 47 days on the market, that's not too long to sit on a house. Um, but when you're at 61, that just shows that, that people were willing to, you know, hold out to get the price that they were wanting. Next slide. The percentage of percent changes of affordability in the largest cities. So RDG did this uh, just for the largest cities. 
um, you know, if you if you line those up and pay attention to the change in income, change in median value, and change in median rent um, throughout Story County, it, it definitely did not keep up with the cost of rent. Um, those those I wouldn't say should parallel each other or be the same. Um, but it, it definitely took a large hike. In this one, they did include aims, um, but the percent of they, I think they wanted to show the percent of income reflected there. Nevada did a pretty good, I wouldn't say a pretty good job um, because you don't want your rents falling behind. Uh, that's when you start to find that economic obsolescence. Um, Huxley's uh, var variable there is very good. Story falling behind on the rent side of things. Uh, Slater's holding pretty close and, and Roland, um, you know, one of the largest increases, but it's paralleled by the, the change in income. Next slide. So then that's uh, taking the market and finding those gaps that we were talking about. Um, so, you know, 50% of media in, median income and below, that would be, you know, affordable homes, um, anywhere from 60,000 and below or a rent of, I believe that's 500 and below. There's a small gap there. Um, and when, it, when it's small like that, it, it's kind of hard to say the amount, but there is a, a gap. But when you get into the, the income thresholds of 50 to 95% in the, with the homes being up to 125, there's a surplus. Um, and, and if you notice, if we remember back in previous slides, people were saying there weren't enough, enough of them. Well, there's a surplus of them. It just doesn't necessarily mean they're for sale. And same thing with when you get into the 90 for, 95% to 140% of median, there's a surplus. But the homes from, and, and I found this really interesting, the homes from 200,000 on up, they identified a gap. Um, you know, once we start getting past 350,000, uh, give or take, you know, 25,000, we're, we're getting out of the affordability range when it comes to median income. Um, so if we, if we focus in on those two thresholds of up to, why, well, in fact, a single one of 250, to build a 1,200 square foot home under 250,000 with a full basement unfinished is very difficult to do in today's market. And those are those gaps that we have to figure out how to bridge because building for less than 200,000 is extremely difficult. Next slide, please. So this is just uh, you know population forecast uh, for those those larger municipalities, um, paralleled uh, you know with you know your percent increase on average. Um, Huxley's got the big spike. I think we all kind of knew that coming in, um, but everybody is showing a, a slight increase. Next slide, please. This one's kind of interesting. They they break it down to uh, figure out how many people uh, commute in to work and commute into Story County. And there's 21,644 people that are commuting into this county every day for employment. Um, that's definitely a market to look into. How do we capture those people? Uh, I shouldn't say capture. Welcome them. We'll say welcome them. Um, live and work in Story County, 21,130. And then the people that live in our county, but commute out, uh, 15,000. Um, and then the graph below that is just gonna show you how far they commute if they do commute outside of their, their home. So less than 10, um, you know, it shows you what direction they're heading. And predominantly you can see on that graph, um, if, it's, if it's getting past, 10 miles, they're heading south, which would be the metro area. Next slide. So there's right there, that's kind of the question everybody's been asking, how many houses do we need? Now, when this says, when I say houses, I need to preface that. This means 
residential units. So that can be apartments. Those can be townhome condos. They can be single family homes. Okay. Um, that doesn't mean that, you know, Gilbert needs 187 single family homes. A fourplex or an eightplex can take care of some of those as well. Um, you can see Huxley's got the, the large chunk at 1,009 over the next 20 years. Um, but what I think is important there for those that aren't listed is to notice the 731 um, for the rural communities that aren't listed here. Uh, th there's opportunity for growth. Um, it's just how do we use this study to leverage to move forward? So next slide. So the issues to overcome, I, you know, I could run down this list, but everybody, you know, in this meeting knows um, the issues to come overcome. It's how do we overcome these? Um, so I'm, in, I'm really not going to spend a lot of time on that slide. Next slide, please. But your opportunities, um, you know, how do you leverage the fact that you have high quality housing stock? Um, the fact that there's demand for rentals, even with the amount of rentals in Ames, um, I, I do find interesting uh, and something that should be taken note of. Um, everybody's school district throughout this county is highly respected. Um, I knew that from just moving here. Uh, my wife and I looked at the school districts and we knew that we could live in any community and have that but that is an important marketing and recruiting tool for every municipality here and obviously we have active developers throughout story county there's construction going on everywhere and we're just a hop skip and a jump from the metro uh, developers as well um, there are quite a few services. Um, there's always a need for more for the underserved, but we do have quite a few here in Story County. And then obviously, uh, you know, <laughs> the demand for new housing, there, it's there. Um, Story County is not unique than any place throughout the Midwest. Next slide. So the directions. Um, thank you. So one of the things when you're in untested market um, to just kind of, if you're a developer, you want to do a housing subdivision and you're going to go get a loan to do your housing subdivision. You're going to go to the bank. The bank's going to say, okay, do you have your 20%? Yes, I have my 20%. Okay, when's the last time a housing subdivision happened in that community? We'll just say 1990 to throw it out there. Um, the bank's going to say that's a high risk market. So not only do you have to come up with that 20%, you've got to come up with another 20 to 30% out of pocket. And for a developer, the developer's going to, I mean, if they have cash in hand and they care about the community, that's great. They might do it. Um, but more often than not, the developer is going to say, no, the risk is too high. I'm going to go to a market where I don't have to come up with that additional 20 to 30 and I'm guaranteed to fill up these lots. So that's where the share the risks with private market come in. That can be with the infrastructure. That can be with soft costs of just saying, hey, if you come to our town, we already have it laid out for you if you want to do it. Um, create a supply of affordable lots. So that's, that can be doing the housing subdivisions yourself. That can be using the existing land that you may already have, whether that's by way of infill lots. That can be using land that you have that you could subdivide out and turn into lots that you may have been planning for an industrial park. Um, one of the goals would be grow rental units for all age groups. So we, we're not just renting to kids in college or just out of college. Um, you know, low maintenance for retirees are, are very desirable, um, especially in our smaller communities, because it, they don't necessarily want to leave the community, but they may not want the maintenance of the two story anymore. OK, so the fostering of grassroots efforts is each community, if they wanted to, could form their own housing committee to try and tackle some of these, thing, these things that would be the ones reaching out to developers, that would be the ones kind of being the buffer between the city council and that developer to, to try and make things happen. 
And then again, with the maintaining of fair zoning and regulations, um, just making sure that uh, you don't have a process that's so difficult that it shies away anybody that might be interested in your market. Those questions and Leanne, did, did you have a couple more slides after this? No? Okay. So one thing I wanted to bring up that, that wasn't in there um, that is land banking. Land banking is essentially all the communities, if you wanted to and wanted to participate, you could say, hey, let's get some land freed up for a developer with our infill lots, if you had them, or some place that you think housing could work that's under city control. And everybody pull together and we contact a developer and say, hey, you know, we already have plans, specifications ready for this. If you build this on this lot, you're going to go through the permitting process, no problem. Um, it's already ready to go for you. All we need for you to do is come in and build. And maybe you charge them a discounted fee on the lot. Um, land banking has been done across the Midwest. It has been successful. It's something that can happen here as well. Um, I breezed through that. Um, Leanne, it, is there anything that you would like to add? I don't think so. I think you covered it very well, Nick. So then now questions, discussion, dialogue. I encourage it. And I do want to thank you, Nick. This is Lisa. And I do want to say that this PowerPoint will be um, sent out um, as well. So that will be available um, for folks um, uh, as well, since I, I know you didn't have it ahead of time. And I know that there's a lot of interest throughout the county in the various communities on housing growth. And that was the reason for, um, one of the reasons for having the study and also the need for affordable housing um, to be available. So thank you for um, your presentation, Nick, and certainly open it up for questions that anyone may have. And we've just, I think we have everybody, you can unmute yourselves if you have a question or use the hand raise button. If I see folks are starting to talk over each other, I can do that. Anyone in here have questions? Well, I just might bring up, and this is something Nick that you and I have talked about before, is the program that the Department of Corrections is operating, I think out of the Newton facility. Talk about land banking and say there are lots, they're permit ready, just come build. Would, would if there were lots like that, can you see, um, see a community utilizing that program? Oh, absolutely. I, I think one of the tricks there is somebody's got to foot the bill initially um to get the house on order um so for those of you in the meeting that don't know homes for iowa uh, started up two years ago and it's at newton correctional facility they build 1200 square foot ranch style homes three bed two full bath um, and they are 75,000 delivered to the site now I say that with a caveat. I haven't checked with them since the lumber market has gone up. Now, I think it's starting to come back down, but we all know that it doesn't come back down as fast as it goes up. But it, let's just say it's still at 75000 So then somebody has to put that bill initially. So if you can pre-sell, that's great, but there's a waiting list, right? Um, you still have to have at least a crawl space, if not a basement underneath it. I always encourage a basement um, just because it, if somebody wants to put the sweat equity into it and increase the value of it by finishing out the basement, that's fantastic. Um, on average, you're going to figure about twenty-five to 30000 to put the basement underneath it. Then you have your rough plumbing and electrical hookups and gas. Um, and then if you choose to put a garage. But all in all, you probably could, in between $150,000 and $175,000, have a brand new home um, in your community. 
the the trick on that is the household income total can't be over a hundred thousand dollars which is is not difficult to find uh you know around here it's just who's going to take the you know who's going to take the first step to make that order put the seventy five thousand out there pay for the basement that it's going to set on electrical plumbing and things like that but it's a fantastic program i really really want to see it happen here someday and if if there could be a way to put the money up front it it could be almost like a revolving fund then correct because when the house set, took that and then that's the next house yes yes it could I see Jody Stempo has a question. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you for this, Nick. It's interesting. And I guess I just want to clarify um, who the, maybe I'm misunderstanding who the study was focused on because these, the options that you shared tonight do not help the clients we serve at the bridge home. Um, we're talking about people who can't even afford average rent in our community, which is $900 a month. Um, these people may never own homes. Uh, and, and so my, I guess my question is, was that demographic looked at at all? How do we house, how do we house those folks? You know, the hundred and some people we worked with this year, um, is there any discussion on how we help them? Right, so in the study, um, we, we'd have to go back a few slides. It, it does discuss, you know, the 50% and below median. Um, in the study itself, it, it doesn't go into absolute great detail. I do know there's the LIHTC, uh, Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. Um, this has been done in Denison, Iowa. They, I think they put in, uh, don't quote me, but it, it was 60, um, I, and it was 80%, it was broke down into percentages on how many of the units was where, and the lower the median, the higher the tax credit they got. But what's interesting about those is the incentive on the developer is to have a, a very quality unit. The higher the taxable value, the better the incentive for the developer. So it, it doesn't just put them, you know, your clients in 400 square foot space. These, they're very nice units. Now, I don't know if it's directly addressed in this study, um, but there are developers out there that specialize in that. Um, Jane LaRoche was the individual I was speaking to when I was in Greene County about possibly doing a project there. Um, there, there is funding out there. Um, that's how I see that happening or something of the like. Um, Jody, on page, this is Latifa, on page 96 of the full study, which I believe is still on the website. Um, they do address development of, uh, or development of a nonprofit developer for housing products at price points well below market rate. Um, and they reference um, Murray County Community Housing Corporation, um, the Story County Housing Trust Fund, and then they present some ideas for how to build truly affordable um, housing. So it, it is addressed, uh, maybe not as in as great of detail uh, as would be helpful to this conversation, but uh, it is in the study. Okay, thank you Latifa for um, letting me know where that is. So then I guess my question back to all of you is, um, what are you thinking when it comes to that demographic, to that population, to those recommendations? Um, you know, what, what are you looking at doing with those 
specific recommendations. One of the, this is Linda, and um, we're still getting feedback from people. And one of the reasons for the, the, um, the meeting tonight was to give the, um, give uh, the local mayors an opportunity if they had some things that they wanted to add that they thought would be helpful in their communities or in response to what's said about their communities. But I do think, and I, and I, I'm glad you brought it up because it isn't just about building houses. Mm -hmm. The study also talks with every community and they give numbers of needed rental units at various levels, as well as housing at various levels. Now, I would say, I don't necessarily agree with, with some of the things I've seen in the study. It's kind of like, well, there's this, there's this gap here because people earn enough money that they could be in a higher, higher priced house. Well, maybe people make a decision not to go into a higher priced house. So I don't think we go and, and, and um, you know, encourage building, you know, more higher priced houses so people get out of lower priced houses to higher priced houses. I, I think there's, I think there's plenty, um, you know, a room for, you know, rentals that are truly affordable and also housing that is truly affordable and that people aren't becoming, as I saw one of the comments in the, in the back, house poor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That's that. Uh, that's pretty much spot on as to kind of my line of thought as well. So, um, I'm. I guess I am hopeful that people are going to look at this closely and for that specific demographic. And as I always say, um, you know, if you need anything from us or want us to be involved in any discussions, um, we are always more than happy to be part of the solution. Um, but from our our side of the fence, that's a pretty big problem in in Story County. Jody, this is Lisa. I concur with you, and I think that's why we wanted to make sure that that demographic was included as part of the study. You know, as well as people with disabilities and you know other things to kind of look at. Um, uh, um, so at least we've got some information as kind of that additional starting point to. To look at or to build upon um, what's currently out there and recognizing what the, the links we still need to go to meet the needs of that particular population. But we do appreciate your voice at the table. Absolutely. And you know, if I may, this is Nick again. You know, that's absolutely wonderful, Jody. You know, that that's where those housing committees definitely come into play and that's that's every voice at the table um and you would be a very strong voice to have at that table so yes thank you very much this is leanne um leanne harder so one thing nick stressed or mentioned this when he went over the presentation but i want to stress it again when the board of supervisors um drafted the rfp uh, to solicit proposals for the study Ames was purposefully excluded. Um, that is a hole that we are at a point now that we need to start addressing how we build that back in. And, um, and some of the findings from the Ames 2040 plan uh, so that we can have a truly comprehensive assessment of what the true needs are. Because I think that may be where some of those other numbers rest are within the Ames demographics and dynamics. Um, not to say it does not ex exist in the other communities, but that is definitely a whole, and, and RDG did recognize that, um, but fortunately they are the consultant for the Ames plan as well. Yes, um, Amelia's got a comment um, in the chat there, Leanne. If she wants to unmute herself. Oh, Amelia, you can just unmute yourself. Yeah. Oh, sure, thanks. I didn't want to interrupt, but I, I have the, you know, searchable plan. And so I found another strategy. Uh, on page eight, it says that, you know, we could focus on affordable transportation options, creating those so that if transitional housing were to be constructed in communities that aren't AIMS, then folks would be able to live in that housing and still commute to AIMS to get the services that may be located inside of AIMS rather than some of our smaller communities. Yes. 
Another interesting thing that I just saw on that same page, I think it's the same page, is that aggregate new housing should target a ratio of 60% owner-occupied, 40% renter-occupied, and that's because they saw, they, they did see a real dearth of rentals in the areas they studied. So I think that also um, gets to the point of, you know, we're not building our, you know, building single family, building our way out of this through single family dwellings that are on our, that are going to be owned. Um, what did you think, Vanessa? Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you were done. I am. Vanessa. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for the presentation, Nick, and the good information. Um, I just want to piggyback on what Leanne said when Ames is excluded because we are in the midst of not only doing our 2040 plan, but we also will be coming up on our five-year consolidated plan, which has a lot of data that HUD gets us that we have to analyze for the city. But to have this already on the roadmap, and then the Ames would be the final piece, I think it's a great start so that we can reestablish the big picture when we first did the study back in 1992. So I appreciate the county proceeding with getting this done uh, with all of the other smaller communities so that we can have that final puzzle piece in when Ames gets all of their data put together. Jody put in the chat, I think if people want to live in Ames, they should be able to live in Ames regardless of their income. Agreed. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, agreed. Good comment. Good comment. Um, Nick, I, I, this is Lisa. So um, one of the comments you made in your presentation was in regards to, um, uh, you know, moving out to the higher income homes and Linda made a comment of that as well as is, you know, we're not wanting to, to push them out or make them what it was a property house, house, house for on that. So I'm assuming, I'm assuming what some of this is, is folks are, are you know, they're not wanting to move into, and I saw this in the report as well, they're not wanting to move into as much as like um, assisted living or um, other type of senior type of buildings. They want to kind of age in place in place there. Is that kind of what you were taking from it? And then my second part of that question would be, um, I didn't see it noted in here, but was there any anything in here that talked about some of the structures when they're being built since folks are wanting to, um, uh, as I would say, age in place um, when the homes are being built to be a little bit more accessible, you know, the doorways potentially wide enough for uh, a wheelchair should that time ever come in the future if they're wanting to make, stay in that particular home or was that too much of a driver of increasing cost? You know, uh, I don't know that it specifically addresses that. Now, I want, just for a point of clarity, the presentation tonight um, was provided by RDG. I'm just kind of the, the mouthpiece um, for them since uh, this is now yours. Um, but when it when it comes to the age in place, yes, um, it, 36 inch doorways, bathroom accessibility, zero entry from the garage. You know, you're, you might be talking about slab on grade type of construction. Um, there are developers out there. I mean, Rita, if she's still on the line, might be able to speak a little bit to that. Um, and, and a lot of those individuals, you know, are, are just on Social Security. And, and, and that's where that afford, affordability factor comes into play as well. Um, but interestingly enough, you know, those some of those homes that that you could see were undersupplied or perceived as undersupplied is, is because people are hanging on to them um, because that facility that we're we just talking about doesn't exist, or if it does, it's already occupied. Right. So you can't. It's very difficult to build. You know. We're kind of losing. The storm is getting very bad in Huxley right now. I apologize. Can you hear me? Dealing with technology, um, that that idea of um, those. Can ideas, you can you come over? Because I'm assuming sorry. folks on that. And I that should know best. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
I can add to what Nick's comments were made too, because another um, spectrum of those families that are not leaving households when they can afford more are those um, likely double income income households that can afford a higher or more expensive structure and um, either because of the situation with children in college or existing student loan debt from when they went through school um, they are choosing even though they could assume a higher mortgage to remain in that household um, and it it's i know many many that are in that situation and throughout all of our communities in story county and that's not atypical by any means sure. I, I think I would go one one step further, you know, with that statement in that there are people that are willing to stay in their home because they are currently debt free. And going into a larger household would mean taking on debt that they may not want to take on at this point in time in their life. Yeah, I think that's very true. Appreciate that comment. Other comments? I don't know if um, Mayor Bappy, if you have any questions or comments. Our biggest issue is we're landlocked. We'd like to, you know, we, we're searching, we've worked with Nick a little bit to um, try and find ways to get land and have builders come in. But we're surrounded by farm fields and, you know, Getting rid of a farm field for uh, houses is not something that farmers look to do. So we're struggling with that, just trying to find ways to even get a house built in town. Do you have infill? Do we have what? Do you have vacant lots inside your city limits or places where there's houses that could be demolished? Um, we, we're looking into seeing what we can do with some city property that could be used. Um, if there's, wow, there might be one, maybe two homes that could be demolished. Um, we're trying to look into see who even still owns some of those houses. Um, I think there's, I know of one. I'm not sure if there's a second one or not. I'd have to look at the second one. Um, but I mean, we've had some discussions at our city council meetings about, um, seeing what we could do with some property that maybe, you know, even as much as our like tennis courts and that stuff, you know, moving some of the basketball hoops and that stuff like that to move some of that area around. So maybe tiny homes. Yeah. Would you, the, the homes for Iowa that Nick was talking about, um, would that be something that you'd think? Your community. We've, we've had a couple of long discussions with Nick about that too. He's, he's come up to Colo and we had a couple of meetings and um, we'd be very interested um, just as soon as we could find some land or maybe a developer. I don't know at this time if our town could afford to do it. Um, I don't know if maybe we need to search for maybe grants or something out there that might help assist with something like that, but definitely do some looking. Okay. Our, our council and, and myself, we are very hungry to try and grow Colo. So we're looking at just about every avenue we can to help grow Colo. And I, I think you would look at, if you look at that from a Cambridge perspective, we're kind of in that same position. Um, we're landlocked somewhat because of floodplain. Uh, and then the other locations that are not floodplain are owned by farmers. And, and there again, we're, we've got the same thing. We do have one house that uh, we would be able to tear down. And we've got one or two other lots that uh, are the size that they could take on a house. But the people that own those lots have been reluctant to sell them at a reasonable price. You know, they're they're asking a hundred or hundred and fifty thousand dollars for the lot itself, and that's that's a pretty high price when you're oh. looking in a smaller town. I heard seventy five in another community the other day, and I thought that was high. Wow. Yeah, I know. I know one of the lots uh, has been marked at a hundred thousand for several years, and I Mark think he's. Lot? 
I'm sorry, say that again. Large? Uh, it is a larger lot, but it's it's not a $150,000 lot. Thank you. So, so you could see if you, let's say, let's say you had a, a lot and, and there was grant money or something that could get a house, you know, on its way. Do you think, you think that would be something that maybe even might be kind of inspiring people if they see it actually, ha see one actually happen? I could see it help swaying the decision, but I'm not sure, you know, exactly what the positions are of some of these lot owners and whether or not they have the funds to actually do that. Thanks. Other folks, um, I saw, I, I don't know if Rita is still on, if she has any comments, thoughts, questions. Star nine or star six by phone. Yeah. One of the two, star nine. Is it? Yeah. yeah. Maybe the technical. Yeah. Maybe the technical. Um, what about? Let me ask. What about rentals? Do you think that um, of the mayors who are on? Do either of you uh, see a, a possibility for a rental unit? And maybe particularly if there was a larger lot, there could be something like a fourplex. Do you think that would be something that there would be need for interest in in your community? So Cambridge, if you look at uh, the old school lot that's there, there is enough space. Uh, we've had looked at that already to put in a couple of four or even eight plexes. Um, there's enough room parking wise to be able to get that in. Uh, the problem is, is that the guy that owns that, uh, the current old school house and, and the lot there is about 78 years old. And I don't think he's looking at taking anything new on um, and, and maybe even looking to sell that property in the not too distant future. So we're kind of at a, at a standstill on that, but there is space to be able to do that. Okay. What's the condition of that uh, old school now? It's, it's got about 10 apartments in it, doesn't it? Correct. And there's also space there, uh, to do additional apartments in the old gymnasium area. Um, they've looked at all of those, including putting in a couple of new either four or eight plex uh, units. But again, you know, it's, it's just kind of one of those situations where the guy had a lot of a uh, lot of things that he wanted to do back when he was 60 years old. But now that he's getting closer to 80 years old, it's kind of slowed up a little bit. And, and do you have any idea how much he would sell for if he were to sell? That I do not know at this point. He has not given a number yet. Nick? Oh, Nick's not on. Yeah, he's, but he's on. I, I just oh. Can you hear me? I can hear you better now. All right. It, it's coming in and out. <laughs> the storm's coming in waves. What I was looking for in the, right now was what the the rental need was that was for Cambridge and I'm trying to find the Cambridge page and I'm just flipping through it because I'm not looking at it online. That is page 79. Yes. Okay. The And I don't know how they kind of calculate all this. I'm taking their word for it. That, that six less than 500 affordable 500 to 1000 range was 20. Well, that's Roland, excuse me. I'm looking at Roland, excuse me. I'm not finding it in Cambridge. Yeah, I'm not finding the same. Yeah, they, yeah, they don't, they don't, don't go they don't as, into as much detail, so right. that doesn't help. Sorry. Sorry, red herring. 
and, and I think they didn't go into a lot of detail on some of some of the communities because any is good, right? Um, when you when you were speaking about the the, the old school, um, you know, Steve and I have talked about that before, and there is the workforce housing tax credit that's affordable out there. Um, that could help that project, depending upon the developers, they wanted to use that, or even I think this structure is old enough, it would qualify for federal and state historic tax credits. Questions? Any additional comments? Oh, Nick is making a comment in the chat. Sorry, Mother Nature, for the technical. <laughs> yeah, I just text with Yeah. So it seems like for the kind of rental units, what is really needed is obvious is interest by a developer to do that. Yeah. And Mayor Kavarik, have you ever talked to a developer about doing something in Cambridge? Is there anybody? Nick says workforce housing tax credit is great for apartments. Okay, that's something to look at. Yeah. So yes, we had uh, talked to some developers um, and it's been a few years. The problem that we ran into is, is when we start talking to the farmers in the area, you know, it, it uh, the, the discussions start going very quickly into how much can the farmer make off of a single acre of land, you know, and, and when we had these discussions, it went from $8,000 an acre to $10,000 an acre to 12,000 to 15,000. And every time the developer turned around, you know, the, the farmer was asking for more money. And the problem that you run into there is the developer at some point in time is just going to say, well, I can't afford to do it for that price. So we're just going to have to walk away. And that's mm -hmm. where we ended up in the last discussions was that they just ended up by walking away because the farmer was asking too high of a price. Okay. okay. That's interesting to know. So that's why if, if that, uh, if some of that, um, some of that uh, land in town could at some point be obtained that probably you've got infrastructure then so you don't have your infrastructure costs for the developer and it might not really be cost any any much more than farmland would cost so that's what the farmers are looking at yeah i think i think our best bet at this point would be to uh, you know, if a farmer freed up land, that would be one thing. Um, and and we're, we're starting up a small group. Uh, it's about three or four people that are going to try to have the discussion with some of the farmers in the area and try and see their taste for letting go, you know, some area, even if it would be 20 or, you know, 30 acres would be, you know, would hold out Cambridge for a long period of time. Um, the other would be if the school, uh, old school, did sell to somebody that had an appetite for putting in some four or eight flex, that would make sense there too. Yeah, because if it's in town, I mean, look at it this way that's land that somebody's not using right now. If it's farmland, that's land that a farmer is using for his business. So I can see that side of it, quite frankly. That if you're given, you know, it might be easier to get land in town. Hmm. Well, I guess the question, unless there's more questions, but I'm kind of looking at we have on our agenda directions forward or kind of next next steps. What? What are we kind of looking at there? Is it more information or? Well, 
what are we kind of thinking? Or I don't know if Nick has kind of thought this through as of yet, if the mayors have any input or thoughts on kind of directions forward. So it sounds like Cambridge has ideas. I mean, mm -hmm. am I right? Did you say that some, there were some groups kind of starting a housing committee? That is correct. We're going to start a housing committee in the next, uh, I would say, in probably in the next month and have some people that are going to try and get out and talk to some of the farmers and even talk to uh, the, the owner of the uh, schoolhouse and, and just see what their future plans are and, and whether or not we can start looking in a direction that would allow some housing to be built. And I think that's a great idea. And I see that Nick uh, typed in that that housing committee in each community would be a great idea as well. And Nick, did you say that you might check with Homes for Iowa and see how they're doing right now. Um, they had some things on their website about how many, and I can't remember the number, of course, but the number of houses they were planning to um, build in 2021 and ticking orders for 2022. Maybe you could check and see is that all still active or still is that still, are they still on track with that? And what are they looking at for costs? Because I'm sensing that that might be something if there's a lot someplace that maybe that's something that could be pursued if a community was interested we could figure out a package how to put together the package for the funding or if maybe there are a couple communities mm -hmm. that we are able to put a package together and buy several or mm -hmm. or support by several mm -hmm. maybe we could work the price down but you never know yeah, you never know. It also might help with for folks to come and see, you know, if you have something in a couple of different areas to see what it is, especially if one is picked up relatively quickly, then you have the other one. And mm -hmm. and I would say there's a lot of information on their website. Just, just uh, you know, do a search for Homes for Iowa. They have information, a lot of information. They have actual floor, the floor plan. It's not, you know, like you, you don't have 50 floor plans to choose from. You have one, but you get the choice of a front or a side entrance. So if you have a narrow lot or a wide lot, and it really, it, you know, it's a three bedroom, two bath house. It's really not a bad house, you know. It's and it's something that, you know, I, I guess I look at anything that can make something easier to do in the beginning, and it, you know, it's not necessarily low hanging fruit because there still are a lot of details to, to put together. But it could be a fairly quick turnaround. I mean, it could be, a, I think. Sure. Sure. Potentially. Yeah, potentially. Um, it looks like it's HMI wants to double the number of houses built in each year. I'm assuming that's for homes for Iowa. Yeah. Yes, from Nick. OK, great. Yeah. So maybe if Nick could check that out and get some information out to you. And maybe to the other mayors, that would be. On the website, it says ninety thousand dollars delivered and set, not a fix. Well, it's ninety now. It was. Hmm. But that's delivered and set. And set. Oh, okay. Just not a fixed. Still not bad. Yeah. Um. But this is going to have a question, please. Uh, Nick, that uh, looking at the previous um, study that was done in the 90s, one of the, the suggestions that came out of it that really made starting the um, Amesbury County Partnership successful was the pooling of funds together that we matched to um, apply for state funds to help create the housing pool that communities all got a piece of. And when you mentioned um, the housing stock in Story County was good, one of the major programs that that program implemented was a housing rehab program in every city uh, that participated in that initial study. 
And so I still think that's worth looking at, especially for the smaller communities that may not have the resources to pull together an application that uh, the county partnered with the city and uh, uh, paid for the administrative costs. The city applied for the grants. We got um, $400,000 that we matched with to create various types of affordable housing from rehab to infrastructure to down payment and closing cost assistance. Do you still see that as a viable option if this updated study? I'm just going to hop in um, real quick, Vanessa. A lot of a lot of those things are are options that the Story County Housing Trust Fund offers now. Um, and I, I don't know if it would be possible to look for more funding through there, but I was just thinking saving administrative um, costs if that wouldn't be an option. Possibly, but there could be other resources outside of the uh, state trust fund money. And Vanessa, <laughs> I'm, I might put you on the spot. Um, would you agree that one of the benefits of that Ames Story County Housing Partnership was the opportunity for all the entities to be around the table and talk and talk through some of the issues that it was a side benefit rather than oh, just no. a benefit? Oh, no question that it was because, you know, that that study initially drove us in one direction rather than uh, looking at all of ourselves individually. Because when you when we looked in one direction, we were able to pool all of our resources rather than compete against each other for funding. And we could see each other's needs and say, hey, here's how we can address that. And we address it as a, as a partnership. And I know we have the Story County Trust Fund and, and I'm talking about something in addition to that to maybe expand it that could it bring in more dollars or, or that could be flowed through the trust fund that comes from other resources that may be out there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think you, you just said it much better than I did, but yeah, not, not, we already have that Vanessa, but more, how could we work with that also and expand on it? I think, I think that's a great idea. I think another question that I have in Leanne that you're here and maybe Vanessa is you talked about wanting to have AIMS folded in so that you've got that more comprehensive study. Do you have an idea of a potential timeline? To I, I don't and I, I will. Um, I have just on the very outskirts watched what's been happening at the AIMS 2040 um, enough just to pique my satisfy my interest. So that is definitely a step. I'll reach out with Vanessa and figure out the pieces and, and what that looks like. Because really when we released the RFP um, in 2019 or yeah, 2019, we didn't even know what that would look like in the long run either. Would it be a, a, another revision, a whole scale plan, a, a revised plan? Um, that's still something. But AIMS had already started. Their study. AIMS had already started. Our RFP, and do we know when they're slated to have the 2040 plan done? I know that. I would defer to maybe Amelia or Vanessa. I don't know. I know that they're going to be bringing some um, action steps to council here soon. Um, I've been really concentrating on CDBG and home and our consolidated plan that will also fall into updating the 2040 plan and feeding into that as well. That's going to be coming up here in the next year. So we have a lot of discussions that are going to be coming up with folding both of those studies together. Yeah, I think um, there's a public draft that's going to be coming to council that Vanessa just touched on and then will be open for public comment and then um, maybe later this fall, I heard would be final adoption and approval? Possibly, yes. Okay. I think so. Kelly would know for sure, but yes, it's, it's in the works. Okay. Thank you. Let me put a couple more things in the chat. Uh, 
um, I would oh, Nick put um, I would additionally recommend a housing task force put together by Board of Supervisors, regional, not individual, perfect. I think the storms died down now. Um, the idea of not thinking of ourselves from within our municipal borders, you know, everybody at the table discussing uh, pooling resources like you guys were speaking of. I mean, that's absolutely the way this should be looked at. And I know we're talking about housing, but if, if I hope that we can also be talking about transportation at the same time that we're talking about housing. Um, and you certainly need to have uh, um, more players on mm -hmm. the transportation and making sure that they're right at the table as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and, and I would just note that uh, housing, transportation, those two things directly correlate to um, what we're hearing at the chamber day in and day out from our chamber members is, you know, employees. We need employees in, in that is directly uh, representative to housing availability and, and transportation. So it, they're all connected. Yeah, you mentioned that, Nick. I, I just found that portion, I'm just trying to find where it was in the report of um, RDG gave, gave some suggestions on kind of how you could partner with businesses um, for incentives for, you know, housing, housing allowances or kind of um, something kind of like a, a 401k, but to go towards housing or other initiatives. I thought that was very interesting that they included. Yeah, there's, there's some interesting things uh, going on in other communities that I've heard of where major employers um, will help pay for daycare. Major employers help bridge the gap on uh, you know for housing in those untested markets they're they're a, kind of a silent partner on the backside um, you know they're the one I mean they need the housing much just as much as our residents do as well it's just they they might be able to afford it now I got to be careful about saying that working for the chamber um, but yes absolutely I, I have seen that done And I, I should say, I wasn't making any assumption on what any particular business could or couldn't do. I just found that the thinking outside the box, the creativity, the ideas suggested were interesting. They're, they're not what I would say kind of your, not the ones that, I, that would have uh, came to the top of my mind. So I appreciated those being part of this report as well. Absolutely. Do we... Um... Do we, we're talking about next steps. Do we want to think about um, having another meeting? I don't know if in this format, but of housing advocates, housing resources like the Housing Trust Fund, uh, the Community Housing Corporation, and, and maybe, you know, a few others to come you know, give some perspectives and, and it's, it's, it's more of ideas on how to move forward. I think, um, you know, what I'm here, what I'm hearing this group basically saying is, as we're looking at, you know, the increased need for work rental. Well, I saw two things in the, in the study really that I was going to bring up, and one of my more I think we already have talked about, was affordable workforce housing, and the other one was affordable senior housing. You know, so I, I would like to see some folks who could talk more about those two issues and also about how we might pull some of this together, what the Housing Trust Fund could do, what the Community Housing Corporation could do, just, just to start percolating some ideas on how to pull it together. And, and maybe at, at the same time, how, while we're formulating those ideas, how do we build in some of that truly affordable housing at the mm -hmm. same time? 
for really low income. You know, the report also talked about kind of spreading the risk and you know, having your other financial institutions as mm -hmm. part of this as well to figure that at some point, see what type of interest or things that they would present to us that questions that we may not be thinking of. Mm -hmm. So maybe somebody in the financial industry who would have some in, very some specific interest in this, and maybe what we're trying to do is say who should be at the next meeting, at, who should be at the <laughs> next meeting, and maybe even who should be on that um, countywide housing task force. Because I I think Nick makes a good point. I think it's great that each individual community has you know as they're interested and have people available has their own housing task force to talk about what they need but then to bring those together with maybe representative of each of those communities and some of these these interests we're talking about on the countywide group mm -hmm. well i think that kind of goes back to or just made me think of um i think it was a comment that that um Nick made or whatever, kind of having those ready places ready to go, um, you know, where you've got the plans already in place. Mm -hmm. And if you hear, if you have those, that kind of regional group together and you hear, oh gosh, Cambridge has something kind of stuff that they'd like to go with and maybe another community, you might then be able to find someone who'd be willing to come in to build in both those communities mm -hmm. and that could cost, be. right, where the cost would be more mm -hmm. affordable potentially. Right. So it's, um, everybody kind of knowing what, you know, what the right and left hand are doing, in other words. Right, right. Well, it, it, it sounds like the last time there was a group discussing housing, it was incredibly beneficial. So I, I think the idea of the countywide task force is fantastic. Are there, I guess I'd like to also hear from the mayors, are there, are there other people that you think that should be part of this, your thoughts initially? You know, it, it might be beneficial once we, you know, get our small group started to have at least one of those people be part of a larger group that would, you know, be discussing more globally what it should look like. Sure. Great. So we have recommended representatives from the individual communities, housing groups, or if they don't have a housing group, maybe the Council, um, we have. I think, I think you're going to want to hear from developers and realtors as well. And I think we need representation from, uh, you know, th those individuals that are struggling to have fa fine housing, affordable housing. Um, that prop, you know, I would recommend Jody not to volunteer. I'm sure she'd be willing to, but not. I'm going to speak for her. Yeah, and I think we might also want somebody from our community services because yeah, Jody works with a, a specific group. There are there are other folks that maybe don't make it to the bridge that community services helps with housing needs, transportation, the, the central, and transportation through the centralized intake process. So I think um, bridge home communities. I think that our county planning and development, we would probably want to have involved. We're writing like crazy here. I'm sure we can put all our lists together and come up with a, a a good start here. Um, I think we got business, financial, lending institutions, developers, business. I would assume this is where you'd also want from like the housing trust fund. Mm -hmm. I've table. got housing trust fund okay. on my list yeah. and the community housing yeah. operation. Employers. Yeah. Yep. Got them. What about inviting another jurisdiction? Thank you. <laughs> Can make you walk 
What about inviting another jurisdiction who has been successful at what you're trying to do? And maybe you could share some of their expertise and maybe designing it as some type of a summit uh, slash mini conference or something like that. That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there's some of that sprinkled through this report, but maybe to ask RDG specifically to say, we're interested in doing this. They might say, oh, well, you know, whoever did this community, whatever. Yeah, I think you're right. There are lots of examples yeah. here. I'm just going to go through. Yeah, actually, some uh, of them I went to their website uh -huh. to look at to look at what they were doing. I have a Empower Rural Iowa Task Force meeting for housing on Tuesday, so I'll ask for best practices there as well. You, you have a what on Tuesday? I'm sorry. Empower Rural Iowa Task Force for housing. Thank you. And we've been talking transportation, but I didn't have it listed. I have it on my list, so I should include transportation. I don't know who would represent it. Well, I mean, I'd have to maybe heard out and mm -hmm. die right yeah. on there. Probably heard him more. Yeah. In rural. Right. Probably heard him more. Okay. So, yeah, we kind of And HERD has also been part of a uh, doing an accessible community transportation mm -hmm. survey that like I've been on part of for Story County, Carla, mm -hmm. se several people have, have been on that. They're doing it region wide, they're region wide, but they're also doing specific county mm -hmm. information as well. Is Vanessa still on? No, she had to sign off. Oh, okay. I think we want to pull the city of Ames in in some way, have them involved as well. Yeah. yeah. And I think Vanessa is a, a very good resource. So. Okay. so I think the two, th two things that we have, or three things, is some of the communities are going to put together a housing um, committee on their own. We would pull together a housing task force for the county with all of these people. Nick is looking at the homes for Iowa, you know, to get more information about that and maybe work on that idea a little bit. Um, and we can do some research on communities that have been successful. Yeah, definitely. Organize having them have mm -hmm. on. I can reach out to some county zoning officials and then Iowa American Planning Association chapter to see if they have examples too. Great. That'd be great. Thanks, Amelia. I think the next question is, are we going to have another meeting like this or do we wait till we get some things formed? Um, I think, I think having a date helps people, helps keep an issue at the forefront of people's um, agendas. Um, I don't know when that date, like how far out we should go with that date. Right. Well, well, and I guess the question is, is the date a meeting to just do something like this, or is it, as we're talking about doing a Countywide housing task force. Is it that meeting? What meeting are we referring to? Here's my thought. I'm not sure this is right, but it's just what came to me. I think it's really is going to need a small group of people to pull this together. We don't just do a y'all come and not have a good plan for a meeting and have it fall flat on its face. Right. And we probably have missed some things. Um, Leanne, let me ask you a question. Um, who is the group that put together the RFP was kind of our planning group. Who was on that that's still around here? Because some, some people have moved. Are you here? Sandra? Yes, Carla. Um, 
year, and so that would be when that would take place. And then John Hall Chamber. and Ruth Hall are Don't remember. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said the name. Zeering? So, no. Was it Zeering? Oh, it was Amy with um, Cola. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have. And we have a development group already in Colo, which Amy's a part of. So I am down Sandra, Leanne, Nick, Carla, Amelia, Amy. I, I put in like Nick and Amelia and for the two people that are no longer here. Who else am I missing? Or was that, is that? Amelia, you got Sandra. Yep. yep. Leanne. Nick, Carla, John Hall, John Hall, oh, John Hall, and Amy. I don't know. Does Carla have the time with so much time going? She does with all the time to I see. I tell you behind the scenes. <laughs> okay, yeah. why don't we say that you can talk with Carla? But otherwise, we've got these three people, and I think it would be good to see if we could get Amy involved because then we have somebody from a city, so it's not just all county, it's county chamber economic development and a city. With just would that group be able to kind of take what we've talked about here today and try to develop a plan for how we would put together the mm -hmm. task force in the first meeting? Okay. Good. And then for that, have them let us know when they've got something put together, sure. then we can set up for the next meeting. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I mean, we could put out for a meeting which I get is when you have it out there, you're kind of pushing things along, but when they haven't even oh, wow. reached out to see if they're available, mm -hmm. that's my only thing of mm -hmm. you set a meeting and. So four of the six people who uh, we just appointed to this task force are here and nobody's run screaming, <laughs> right? Well, the, um, the weather is so bad here right now. I, I can't hear what you're saying. Oh, you're, oh you've, been, you've been volunteered, okay. Nick. Yeah, all right. I'm used to voluntold. I'm used to voluntold. We've kind of gotten into that, haven't we? <laughs> That's all right. Good. Good. So, we have Leanne. Have a, yeah, um, I'm going to throw her under the bus because she left the call, a uh, teacher. I think involving Vanessa would be, um, yes. see if she has some time, especially while, um, she has the expertise dating back to the original study too. I mean, she was right. part of the drafter of that and knows some of the lessons learned from that 28E and the parties that were part of that agreement too. I think that's a great idea, thank you. And um, I'll check with the county attorney's office to make sure that um, all open record, that this, this group is formed in the right way. I'm just going to remind gotcha. the board of that. We may need to follow some up. There may need official action by the board, too. Mm -hmm. And if that may be, then that <laughs> maybe that not be, be but on maybe. our that would need to be then something on our mm -hmm. uh, agenda. To, to I need that. to do my due diligence and, and remind you of that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Otherwise, I think Ethan will help me down, I think. <laughs> okay, so it sounds like we've got kind of a plan holding off on the next meeting time for right now. Do we, we kind of have a goal of how soon we'd like to get back, get get an invitation the, out or? And we want to clarify the charge just to make sure that we know exactly what the That's right. Is. Yeah. Right. Yes. <laughs> That's a very good point. Um, if this is Jody. Before we sign off, I just want to say thank you. This was a really good discussion tonight. 
Um, and I uh, appreciate all the different ideas and venues and demographics we're talking about now. And I'm really excited about this and look forward to being part of figuring out how we can help the folks in our community who really need us. So thank you. Thanks, Jody. Thanks, Jody. And do you think, oh, Sandra, since you mentioned that, can you kind of lead this work group into putting together the, from what we talked to tonight, can you draft something for the supervisors? Sure, we need For a charge? Oh, when do we need it? Yesterday. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, a couple, you have to get the group together and maybe that's the first thing you do is what I would say. Or, yeah. well, I, or I, I, was, was the reason, was it that the group needs to know why they're getting together? Right. They do. Right. Yes, I, I certainly want to make sure that I'm clear on that. Yeah. So, yes. so how about you draft, would you be willing to draft it and get it to us to look at? Well, I think that would be fine. And, and I, I think Leanne would... needs to talk with Ethan about the process. So maybe you two could work together on that. Sure. Does that work? That would work. I just want to make sure that Sandra has some clarity of what we're kind of thinking to draft up. Right. The clear because right now I'm not 100 percent sure. Maybe Leanne knows, and maybe after we talk, it'll be clearer in my mind. But I'm just not sure. I'm 100 percent positive on exactly what the expectation is of the group. Are we planning a task force, or is this the task force, or? So I wrote, I wrote down some directions. Yeah, I would come up. Well, then she will be able to be it. I wrote down some directions for just in my notes. Um, define a process for bridging. This is housekeeping, keeping the bridging, the aims and countywide studies. Um, continuing outreach on the study, and that may include additional meetings that were addressed. And then defining the housing task force approach being reflective of the Ames Ray County Housing Partnership and lessons learned. It's kind of the three key takeaways. I mean, there's some like Nick looking at the homes for Iowa. Um, those are really concrete, but the larger big picture is, are the three entities, are the three ideas I noted. I kind of see too, in my opinion, the overarching need is looking at this report shows the need for housing in the next 10 years and 20 years. And what are, how, how are we going to, how, how are we going to help communities attain that? And that's more than 10,000 foot view. It is. Kind of. it is. That's, that's, that's what I'm looking at. Too, it's, it's basically, it's basically to provide let me write maybe, something. Yeah, maybe each of us should yeah, just talk right. to you individually. Yeah, that might be, or just send some ideas. Because I'm, yeah, I'm still thinking about it. Because there's, yes, we're asking you to bring together, to start it, to bring together the task force and a plan for a first task force meeting. But what is the task force going to do? And that's the 10,000, 20,000, whatever for you. Right, right. We'll talk. Yeah, because certainly my concept right now is up here where right. I need to be down mm -hmm. here to make those incremental yeah. steps. Yeah, the things that you're, you're talking about to me are more steps towards the end. They're good ones and the ones we can't lose track of, but they're not the end. So deliverables. Yeah. So she's talking about deliverables that is. Okay. All right. Any other comments? questions before we end this evening? Just unmute yourselves or raise your hand, whichever you prefer. Anything else from? No, I, 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 think, I think we can all agree this was a really good conversation and I'm grateful that everybody joined us at night in the middle of a storm. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I want to thank everybody too that joined us and I kept thinking I was hearing rain coming down outside here and uh, just be safe and thanks for all your input tonight. I'm really glad that we had to discover Zoom. 
Yeah, because I, we're having more work sessions that we're, we're posting and inviting people to and getting more feedback. And this is just a really good example of it. I think it's, it's about everybody, you know, a whole lot more people couldn't have been here, but we had a good group tonight and we had some good discussion. This really got us going here with, with the direction. So I want to thank everybody who um, here in person or who zoomed in tonight for, for participating in a work session. It's, we'll have more. Maybe some in person. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Have a good night.